Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The other day I was struck by an article in the New York Times that shared some rare good news. After decades of frightening statistics about growing obesity, heart disease, and diabetes in this country, it would appear that the trend is finally reversing. Slightly, mind you, but reversing. According to a recent study, Americans are actually eating healthier and losing weight. We are reading, and importantly, heating, nutrition labels and eating smaller portions. We are even avoiding the drive through window and the vending machines a bit more often. Now, scientists cite a number of reasons for this changing behavior, but the shrinking bottom line is this. Americans are finally getting the message that what we put into our bodies matters. And this is very good news. But frankly, we've known this for a long time. We know that there are nutritious foods that can sustain us and keep us healthy, and we know that there are junk foods that give us nothing but empty calories and pack on the pounds and, and throw our bodies out of whack. Nutritionists will tell us that the good stuff is found in foods that are closer to the source, that are more complex, less processed, whole grains that keep the husks on, fresh fruits and vegetables with lots of fiber, lean proteins, good oils. These are the foods that keep our body strong. But unfortunately for many of us, especially in times of stress, it is the sugar-laden, highly processed stuff that we reach for first. And then strangely enough, we call this food comfort food. Like every living creature, food is central to our lives. And because we are human, we eat for reasons beyond just feeding our bodies. We also eat to feed our souls. We create rituals around food. We build relationships through it. And if you watch any one of the dozens of cooking shows, it's clear that we also obsess about it. It's about so much more than just vitamins and calories. Eating good food is one of the great joys of being human. In our scripture story this morning, the author John taps into our primal love of eating when he refers to Jesus with a food metaphor. He calls him the bread of life. Now this is just one of scores of metaphors that John uses in his gospel. He also calls Jesus the gate, the light of the world, the vine, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, and the life, and the resurrection. All of these together are known as the seven I am statements of Jesus. And curiously, they are only found in John's gospel. And I think it speaks to the particular situation of John's community. You see, John's group was living almost a century after Jesus, and they longed for a visceral experience of him. None of them were around to hear him preach or see him heal or turn water into wine. And so John was constantly seeking for ways to tell the story of Jesus that would make him feel real for them, that would help them remember who they are and what they believe. And it was not easy. For living in the aftermath of the destruction of their beloved temple in Jerusalem, scattered into the hostile territory of the Roman Empire, the early Jewish Christian church was undergoing a serious identity crisis. The religious world was in total disarray. Who were they now that their temple was gone? Should they double down on their Jewish faith or follow the new strange teachings of Jesus? Or should they just give in to the pressures of the empire and worship Caesar? Certainly it would be easier to go along with the prevailing powers both inside the synagogue and on the Roman street. Those were familiar. It would keep them safe. But they wondered, would it feed them? Would it transform them? Would it last? Jesus' radical teachings were at the heart of their new faith, and they did indeed feel the power of God within them. But having no personal memories or experiences to draw from, they couldn't help but wonder, who was Jesus really? What was he about? What was his relationship with God? What's his relationship with me? 
2,000 years later, I think we have very similar questions, don't we? We wonder who Jesus is and what he means for us. We wonder what a relationship with him is all about. And just like the folks in John's community, many of us are also in a spiritual identity crisis. We're alienated perhaps from our old ways, but unsure about where else to go. And like them, we are surrounded by many different practices and doctrines and teachers telling us that they have the formula to get us right with God. Some tell us to be more religious. Read the Bible this way. Join this church. Recite this creed. Avoid this food. Pay this tithe. Some pressure us to be more secular. Read this author. Take this class. Try this yoga pose. Repeat this mantra. Volunteer for this cause. It's no wonder that many of us are confused. We are overwhelmed with choice and with contradiction. Sometimes we try to cling to what we know, only to find that many of our old beliefs have proven hollow, propping up systems of patriarchy and sexism and heterosexism that erode human dignity and leave us excluded and alienated and empty. We look at doctrines that place rules in front of love, And we read scripture that puts compassion behind, that puts, that puts scripture, truth before compassion. And we have a very hard time swallowing it. We see faith used as a weapon instead of wisdom. And we wonder how any of this can possibly feed our souls. But finding a faith and living it with integrity matters to us. Experiencing a deeper relationship with God matters to us. If it didn't, we wouldn't be here. So where, we, where do we find that nourishing faith? And how do we know it is real and lasting and not the spiritual equivalent of empty calories? Jesus himself seems pretty attuned to these questions. He knows that we are hungry, and he also knows that reaching for the good food is not always in our nature, that we like shortcuts, and easy fixes. We're addicted to convenience. And so Jesus calls us on this. And master of metaphor that he is, he challenges us to change our diet. This passage that Phyllis just read comes on the heels of the very familiar story of the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes, where Jesus feeds thousands with just a handful of scraps. Where there was once nothing, there is now a feast. Where there were grumbling stomachs, there are now baskets full of leftovers. This is what God is like, he tells them. This is how she intends the world to be. And the crowds on the hillside are wowed. They've never seen anything like it. This Jesus guy must be the real deal, they figure, if he can give us this food. And of course, once they've gotten a taste, they want more. So they follow him across the sea and they track him down. Now, one would hope that they were craving his teachings and hoping to absorb his message. But Jesus is pretty skeptical. He does understand human nature too well. And he says to them, you aren't following me because you've seen God at work. You're following me because I fed you and for free. But that's not what I'm about. I'm not about impressing you with flashy miracles and signs. I want to change your life. I don't want to give you something that just tastes good now. I want to feed your soul forever. I think many of us can relate to those disciples. We are drawn to spiritual teachers who tell us what we want to hear and promise us salvation without pain. It's all about being happy, they say. God wants you to be rich. We are God's favorites. You are the most important person in this room. And so we rush to buy their books and download their podcasts and convince ourselves that we have at last found the way. Most of us want a savior who tells us we can keep our faith safe and small and instantly gratifying. We don't want to have to work for it or risk for it or wrestle with it. We want the wonder bread, not the multigrain. But spiritual junk food will only leave our souls hungry and our faith weak. It cannot hold up against the messy realities of our lives, the sorrows and the heartbreaks, the betrayals, the disappointments, the loneliness. 
because a faith that comes easily will fade just as fast. We need the real stuff, the stuff with fiber and husks that builds our spiritual muscles, the stuff that grows closest to the source. Jesus tells us he is the bread of life. He is the food that lasts. And if we believe in him, we will never go hungry. But that also sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? So, okay, Jesus, we might say, we're listening. But now it's our turn to be skeptical. What does it mean to believe in you? What's that going to cost us? How do I know you are the real deal? Getting a grip on what it means to believe in Jesus is a core issue for many of us. That concept can be so loaded. And so first, I think we need to let go of some of the baggage that it carries. Many of us have been in churches and traditions where we had to swear to statements of faith that challenged our morals and our intelligence. In those cases, belief is often reduced to a set of intellectual propositions and assent to theological statements about Jesus. But that is not what that word means for Jesus. For him, it is so much deeper. It's a heart thing more than a head thing. For Jesus to believe in him means to place our trust in him, to put our confidence in him. The modern world word that is translated here as believe is actually derived from the old English word below, which came to be known as beloved, which means to give our hearts to, which is a very different thing. If we remember who Jesus is and what he is about, we know that he doesn't care too much about catechism, and he's definitely not into doctrine. He has very little patience for formula and rules that judge and exclude. What matters to Jesus is how we live, how we love. He wants to see that our faith in him has changed us, has transformed us. Are we caring for the least of these, he wants to know. Are we forgiving one another? Are we seeking justice? Are we waging peace? Are we seeing him in each other? And so when he tells us that if we believe in him, we will never feel that empty place inside of us, he does mean it. For we never again will feel that hunger, not for love or for peace or for mercy or for compassion. We won't have to. When we are in alignment with the way of Jesus, which is centered on love, we will be filled with all of those things. And there will be more than enough to share. But this kind of lasting spiritual food is not easy to digest. It's complex. It's fibrous. It takes time to grow and discipline to prepare. How much simpler it is just to reach for those empty calories, those spiritual cliches, the showy prayers, the trendy gurus, the practices centered only on making us feel good about ourselves, the beliefs that cast judgment on other people's bad behavior while justifying our own, the ones that convince us that God is on our side, waving our flag and scoring that touchdown just for us. That kind of self-centered faith is too easy, and like junk food, it will ultimately leave us hungry. Now, I'm not saying that all faith that feels good is empty, because faith should be joyful. It should bring us comfort and hope. But it's only when our faith stops at our own needs that we get in trouble. A healthy faith always takes us through ourselves and beyond ourselves and connects us to the wider world. It reminds us that God's love crosses all boundaries, and we should too. Jesus calls us behind that easy, processed, instant kind of faith into one that opens us up, challenges us makes us vulnerable to each other, stretches us sometimes in ways that are very uncomfortable, and gets us to see God at work and people in places where we least expect it. A crunchy, granola kind of faith. 
Jesus said, if you want the bread of life, don't just love your friends, love your enemies. Don't just pray out loud, pray from the heart. Don't just write a check, get your hands dirty. Share what you have, forgive ceaselessly, visit the prisoner, welcome the stranger, speak up for justice, do the hard right thing that makes the world a better place. These are the practices that put meat on our bones. These are the ones that will stick to our ribs. Friends, what we put into our bodies matters, and what we feed our souls with matters as well. May we always reach for the food that leaves us strong and ready to live boldly and love courageously and be able to reach out to God in the dark, frightening times, especially in the dark and frightening times. And may we resist a faith that keeps it all about us and always choose the bread that really satisfies the bread of life. And may we never be hungry again. Amen.